The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar on Shifting Paradigms, the Potential for Quantum Social Change. I'm Christina Cook. I work at the Montreal Hub of Future Earth, who's hosting this webinar. The webinar is also supported by SDG Transformations Forum and the Future Earth Transformation Knowledge Action Network. Future Earth is a platform to bring the knowledge and practice of sustainability science into the change processes of society. Just a few housekeeping notes. We're recording this webinar, so it will be available online in the next day or two. And today we have a, a format of uh, two presentations of different lengths and some uh, responses to come from, from other folks who you won't see just yet, but will arrive a little bit later. And then the remaining time may be set aside for a question and answer. So if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please type them into the question box and we'll collate those and as time allows, work through the questions. For now, I'll pass the baton to Karen O'Brien, our chair. Okay, thank you and welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about shifting paradigms and the potential for quantum social change. And um, as Christine mentioned, it's sponsored by, or it's organized by the Adaptation Connects research project, which is really looking at the relationship between adaptation and transformation, um, and in particular, what types of transformations are needed in order to successfully adapt to climate change. Um, and it's part of the Transformations Knowledge Action Network, and one of the questions we're interested in is, what type of knowledge are we taking action on? And that's kind of the theme for today. Um, the webinar agenda is after a brief introduction to this topic and you know, questioning whether it's time for a quantum leap, we're going to turn to Alexander Wendt from Ohio State University who will talk about the politics of ontology and resistance to quantum and quantum as resistance. Um, he'll talk for about 30 minutes or so and then um, we'll look at um, quantum in practice and Anne Elkori from Macquarie University will talk about applying quantum ways of knowing and doing. Um, about um, alternative um, development pathways. And finally, we'll have three reflections from Leonardo Orlando from Science Po, Chad Manfreda from Princeton University, and Ananka Laubser from Northwest University in South Africa. And after that, Anne and um, Alex will give some responses to the reflections and we'll open up for some questions. Um, one of the questions um, that I've asked myself over time is um, really, you know, is it really time for a quantum leap, um, metaphorically um, and also in terms of our of paradigms? Um, as many people know, there's been a lot of talk um, in recent years and months and weeks about you know, where we're at in terms of climate change. Some researchers are saying we have about three years to safeguard the um, Others are saying that we pretty much have like a 5% chance of reaching the Paris climate goal. Um, a 1% chance of the 1.5 um, goal. So there's a lot of stress on you know, whether we can actually do this, and there are a lot of scenarios um, for you know, the directions that we're going in. But we all know that it's not just about climate change. There are many other issues that are also important related to um, the environment, such as biodiversity loss or ozone depletion, but also about society, social equity, um, food, water, um, jobs, gender equality, and so on. So we're really trying to figure out how do we transform at this scale of, that is um, very much unprecedented. Um, we want to do it, transform at a scale, magnitude, um, rate, and depth that we don't really know how to. And when we look at um, kind of the literature on systems change, we start to see that um, you know the highest leverage points for system change really are in the paradigms, the mindset or paradigm from which systems are um, being um, developed, but also the, um, the power to transcend paradigms. If we look at the classic paradigm for climate change, it's very much um, in the dominant discourse is that, you know, humans are completely material, mental states are nothing but brain states, and consciousness is an illusion or epiphenomenal. Um, humans are individually, um, biologically and mentally separate. So we have this subject object dualism and nature is separate um, from humans. Um, and there's no role for experience, meaning or purpose um, because these depend on consciousness. So if we're in a situation where there is no free will and choice is an illusion, then what type of future can we have when the choice is you know, um, about um, whether we're in a 
um, less than two degree world or more than two degree world. And I think Alexander Wendt will talk about this, um, the idea of humans as machines or um, zombies versus um, active agents of change. So if these assumptions are wrong, what, hap what happens then? And um, when we look back in science, quantum mechanics came along and really forced physicists to reshape their ideas of reality and to rethink nature, um, the nature of things at the deepest level and revise their concepts of position and speed and notions of cause and effect. So while this revolution has been going on in, um, in science, we haven't had a real parallel revolution in social science. And um, this is, um, if, um, Alexander Wendt um, has been challenging this and starting to consider that, you know, maybe what if humans were quantum social organ um, um, social beings? Um, and he, what we'll hear about is that if human beings really are quantum, then classical social science is essentially founded on a mistake and social life will require a quantum framework for its proper understanding. And this is really challenging um, theoretically and practically, but it's also really exciting because it's it's models. And if we take it into prax practice, NL Corey's work in Kerala, India, is showing that there are you know there is the potential for this probabilistic social science where reality and the representation of reality, or its performance and construction, incorporate potentiality and not just actuality. So this idea that there are possibilities comes up in a quantum paradigm, and we start to see that um, the social world looks quite different. So I'm going to hand it over to Alex, and I think that um, what's really exciting about his work um, is on page three. It says, in this book, I explore the possibility that this foundational assumption of social science is a mistake, you know, the classical paradigm, by rereading social science through the quantum. More specifically, I argue that human beings are therefore social and therefore social life exhibit quantum coherence in effect that we are walking wave functions. And this is really um, um, challenging, it's really exciting and it's potentially groundbreaking. And so what we wanna do is really think through the quantum of you know, like the possibilities for changing our own paradigms for um, global change research. So Alex, I'll pass it on to you and look forward to your, your presentation. All right, well, thank you, Karen, and thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I do things the old fashioned way, so I have my notes. I'll be looking up and down and doing the best I can. Um, please, uh, should I, let's see, can I close my screen there? Am I okay? Okay. Um, so, and I especially want to thank you for allowing me to try out a new idea, um, which is to say, I'm not going to present the book that Karen just briefly described, um, except very, very briefly up front. Um, instead, what I want to do is talk about some a certain kind of reaction that I've gotten to the book uh, that I think says something interesting about the politics of social ontology and quantum social science more generally. Uh, this idea is very unformed. Um, this is only the second time I presented it and literally the first time I presented it was three days ago and I haven't even had a chance to incorporate the comments I got then. So this is the exact same talk I gave three days ago. So um, apologies for that. Um, on the other hand, you're a completely new audience and so it's really like presenting it for the first time all over again. So I'm very much looking forward to your reactions and, and, and so on. So just very briefly about the book itself, and, and Karen actually already said most of what I was going to say, um, the basic argument is that you know, drawing on quantum consciousness theory, um, the human beings are uh, macroscopic quantum mechanical phenomena, and that, that, that the sort of uh, the sound by version is that we're walking wave functions. And importantly, I mean that claim uh, not in a metaphorical or analogical sense, but in a realistic sense that we really are quantum beings, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, I then go on to show how this quantum model of, of man uh, relates first to the classical model that dominates the social sciences today. Um, and then I apply that model of, of human beings to a broad range of questions in, in social ontology um, all of which are mediated by language. And so language is actually a crucial um, variable, so to speak, in the overall story. And I try to argue that uh, language itself is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. So the argument is very speculative. I'm, I'm very clear about that. Although I would suggest it's no less speculative than the classical model that we all take for granted, which seems to me to have even less sound foundations than my argument does. But in any event, this is a speculative uh, claim. But I argue at the end of the book that it is, quote, too elegant not to be true, is my, is my suggestion. 
So rather than go through that argument, as I suggested up front, I want to talk about a certain kind of reaction I've had to this. Uh, most of the reactions I've had are, are positive, um, or at least puzzled in a positive way. Um, but there have been some reactions that have been quite negative, and, and those reactions, I think, are a symptom of something. Um, symptom of something political, which is what makes interest me in this in this line of argument that I'm going to give you today. Um, and in particular, what seems to bother some of the critics is not the scholarship in the book, although people may complain about that in part, but not too much. Um, the main thing that bothers these critics is this claim that human beings really are quantum beings, uh, rather than only making an analogy or a metaphor. And indeed, it's not just critics who um, shy away or, or are critical of that claim. Even some of my allies, like Jerome Busemeyer and others, in what I would call the Bloomington School, um, and whose work I would rely heavily on, um, they too are reluctant to make a realist um, claim. Show my screen. Do I need to be doing something? Am I okay with my screen here? Okay, well. You're fine. Continue. I'm fine? Okay. I'm fine. All right. Um, so it's not just my critics, but also some uh, of my allies who are reluctant to make this kind of claim. Um, and there seems to be, in a sense, a, a taboo, in a, as way of, one way of putting it, on this idea that human, the claim that human beings really are quantum. Um, and that's what I want to go after. Now, of course, this taboo or this skepticism immediately invites the response that, well, are the skeptics saying that the classical model is really true, or is that, too, only a metaphor? Um, my guess is, it's, it's kind of ambiguous, I think, in the literature, um, but my guess is that most social scientists believe that human beings really are classical systems. So they're not making a, a metaphorical claim, they're making a realistic one. Um, even though the experimental evidence in psychology would suggest otherwise, but in any event. Um, so so um, in that sense, they want to sort of position, my argument is that most a metaphor and therefore I think more easily uh, dismissed. So what I want to explore with you today is, is the question of why there is so much resistance to quantum social science understood in this realistic uh, manner. Um, and in particular, I'd like to discuss first very briefly three what I'm calling non-political sources of resistance. Um, and then I want to focus in a little bit more detail on a fourth source of resistance, which I'm calling a more political one, and that's the one that I'm most interested in, of course, as a political scientist. Um, but first, let me say a few words about why I chose a realist interpretation of the whole story to begin with, because I knew beforehand that this would get me into a lot of trouble. It would have been much easier to make a metaphorical argument, but I didn't want to do that, and that was quite intentional. So, so why be a realist about this quantum social science idea? Well, the main reason, in my view, is that the quantum model of man and society is true. Um, and if it's true, why would you diminish the theory in any way by saying it's only a metaphor? Um, of course, I can't prove it's true. This is just a belief. But because I have that belief, naturally, I would want to defend the realist claim. Um, but moreover, if most social scientists think that human beings and society really are classical systems, then the only way to pose a direct challenge to that orthodoxy is to claim that it's wrong on realistic grounds. In other words, if you want to dislodge the classical orthodoxy, a metaphor argument is not going to do it. They can easily be dismissed as, well, that's just a metaphor. The reality is classical, and that's what we should be focusing on. So what I'm trying to do, in a way, by taking this realist line is to force um, the orthodoxy to defend itself, in a sense, to justify its ontology, to tell us why human beings are really classical systems and not quantum ones. Um, and a metaphor argument could not have that kind of rhetorical um, edge to it. So another way to put this is, is that as a truth claim about the nature of human beings, a realist view has kind of a coercive quality to it. It's saying that we must believe this perspective, not that it's a fun metaphor to play with for certain kinds of purposes. So it's that coercive quality to the realist story that I think is a source of some of the uh, underlying resistance to, to the argument, as you'll see as I unfold the rest of my uh, notes here. So a few words about some what I'm calling non-political sources of resistance. Uh, and these are very quick and they're very quite obvious. Uh, one will be psychological, 
for any individual social scientist who was trained in, in a classical way, uh, the quantum approach is a direct, a realist view of the quantum approach is a direct challenge to all the work that they've done in their whole career in a sense, right? Um, and so a quantum uh, model creates a lot of cognitive dissonance and it's perfectly understandable that scholars with a career invested in classical thinking wouldn't want to have that completely upended um, and have to sort of re remodel themselves, so to speak. So that, that's on a psychological level. Then there's the social psychological dimension. Uh, social scientists are pack animals, herd animals. Um, and so we're all very sensitive to the peer pressure um, of colleagues. Um, and so if the orthodoxy says, especially if the orthodoxy is at Harvard, if the orthodoxy says that quantum social science is junk science, well, then social scientists have to choose whether to stick with the safety of their peers, the safety of numbers, or in a sense, go rogue, right, and buy this very speculative kind of story. And quite naturally, most social scientists, even myself in a previous life, um, would have gone with the, with the herd rather than go off in this separate direction. And then finally, there's a sociological dimension, um, which is that the government and private agencies that control research grants and so on that many scholars obviously depend upon, they are usually part of the classical orthodoxy um, and are unlikely to approve any grants that rest on heterodox or highly speculative assumptions about the nature of consciousness or, or human beings. And so a good rational social scientist would naturally avoid making such assumptions, um, at least in public, um, so that they can get their work funded and they can proceed with their careers. Um, so those are kind of um, the non-political sources of resistance. What I want to do now, though, is to say a bit more about what I'm calling this political source, uh, because the three, the first three are very obvious and would probably be true in almost any um, uh, context where you're talking about paradigmatic change. Uh, after all, science is a very conservative enterprise. Uh, that means we have to protect the knowledge we already have. Um, against renegade arguments. Um, but I think there's also something deeper going on here, rather than just science being conservative. I think that um, the reactions that I've, these more negative reactions that I've gotten to the book suggest to me that the, the classical worldview is tied up with the state in producing a certain kind of person and thus a certain kind of society. Um, and I think it's attachment to that kind of person and attachment to that kind of society that is the political um, basis of the resistance to this kind of argument. And the inspiration for my thinking here comes, and many of you will already know this um, work very well, comes from Michel Foucault, who in his later work introduced the idea of what he called governmentality. The essential idea of which is that at least since the 18th century, Governments in the West and now all over the world have been in the business of trying to produce a certain kind of subject, a certain kind of person, um, a certain kind of citizen, uh, namely one who will follow most of the rules and laws of their, their society on their own without direct coercion by the state. So through socialization, training, maybe a bit of coercion, education, and so on, uh, the idea is to sort of orchestrate people's conduct, um, what Foucault called the conduct of conduct, um, to shape it to, so that people are self-regulating um, and don't require the state to watch over them constantly. But they'll self-regulatingly, so to speak, um, follow the rules. And that in turn, I think, has effects at a social and a political level, because self-regulating, well-behaved citizens will be more predictable, more calculable, more obedient, and thus can be mobilized more easily by the state for its political projects, whether it's nation building, going to war, or whatever it might be. In short, governmentality is a way to produce social and political order at very low cost to the state. Now, to my knowledge, Foucault never discusses the underlying ontology of personhood um, that is behind this governmentality argument and in particular whether human beings are truly classical or truly quantum beings. Um, however, given that he is writing about a period from the 1700s onward, um, the only ontology available at that time, for a couple centuries certainly at least, was a classical one. 
Um, so when, if you think about it, when states were busy creating these loyal self-regulating subjects, they were at least implicitly doing so on the assumption that we are born as classical beings. Um, but I think this is actually only part of the story of classical governmentality. For if human beings are actually quantum beings, then classical governmentality is not merely teaching us to be self-regulating in our behavior and to observe the rules of society. It is also teaching us to repress, and I guess I use this in a psychoanalytic sense, to repress our natural quantum selves and to replace that underlying quantum self, or not replace, but to overlay that underlying quantum self with an artificial truncated classical self um, that has far fewer capabilities and potentialities than we truly have underneath. Classical cells will be more orderly than quantum selves, and hence their attraction to the orthodoxy, so to speak. Um, but I think the effect of repressing our natural state is an effect to produce neurotic subjects. We are all neurotic in a sense because we are have learned from day one um, to, to repress this natural quantum state in favor of this artificial um, classical one. <coughs> um, so in a sense, people cannot, we cannot be true to ourselves, I guess, is the intuition here. We all need therapy. We're all suffering from false consciousness in a way because of this governmentality effect um, that, to which we've all been subject. So this is at the level of the individual. Um, but now imagine a whole society of such neurotic creatures. It's no wonder in a way that our whole world is messed up if we're all repressing something that has put so much more potential than we actually realize. So I think part of the resistance to quantum social science, to a realist view of quantum social science, comes not from the state per se, but from the kinds of people that states produce, namely all of us as classical subjects. Um, we are, in a sense, identified with and attached to this classical way of thinking about social life, and as a result, are reluctant to let go of that. And that's, of course, part of the whole problem of paradigmatic change is that it requires sort of rethinking your, yourself and the world in some fundamental way. So I think what this argument highlights, and this is the direction I'd like to take in the future, but are, is still very underdeveloped, what this argument highlights is the importance of pedagogy, of education, um, since it's education that produces classical subjects. And I think you can, we can see this on at least two levels that are of interest to me. The first and the most obvious one is in graduate school, and in, in particular methods training in graduate school. I don't know what it's like there in Europe, but certainly here in the States, almost all graduate students in social science will take a whole year and sometimes two years of quantitative methods training. But of course, that methods training is all classical. It's based on classical logic, classical probability theory, classical statistics, and so on. Moreover, those classical methods are taught to our grad students as if they were the only way to think about probability, logic, statistics, and so on. In other words, it would be one thing if, as in physics, grad students come in and are given a choice. They're told in certain situations, if you're measuring the movements of the planets, you probably want to use a classical framework. If you're talking subatomic particles, you can use the quantum framework. So there's a choice, right? Um, that's not how it is in social science. In my experience anyway, certainly in my own methods training as a grad student, classical methods were taught as if this was the only game in town. Um, and I bet the vast majority of social scientists um, have never even heard of quantum, quantum probability theory, quantum logic, um, quantum statistics, et cetera. And that matters, I think, not just because methods training affects how we test our theories, which is kind of why our students are learning all these methods. You've got to see that's the official reason. But it matters in a deeper sense because um, methods training, I think, also shapes how social scientists think, how we conceptualize, how we theorize about human beings and social life more generally. Especially here in the US, a lot of social science research and theory is very method driven rather than theory driven. Um, and so once grad students have learned how to use their classical hammer, 
then everything becomes a nail in effect. So in this light, um, classical social science is in a sense complicit in or part of the state's project of producing classical subjects. Uh, not intentionally, of course, this is not a conspiracy argument. It's more a structural argument in the sense that the effect of graduate methods training is the same, which is to help produce people who will in turn help produce a classical social world. So that's at the graduate level where I think you can, these pedagogical effects are interesting. But I think the deeper effect is at the level of elementary school up through college, starting let's say in kindergarten. So at the beginning of the pipeline and up rather than just the end of the pipeline. Um, and I suspect, though I don't have any evidence of this, but I, my suspicion is that starting at the very beginning of our education, we are taught that logical means classical logical, either or logic, that probability means classical probability, and so on, that rationality means classical rationality, etc. So by the time students get to grad school and are ready to have formal methods training, their minds have already been hardwired, and literally hardwired, um, or prepped to um, receive a more explicit indoctrination, in a sense, in classical methods and the classical worldview. Now, I don't know very much about the academic field of education, but this argument suggests that an interesting research project would be to go look at the textbooks that little kids are given, and kids throughout school up to college, and look and see to what extent are those textbooks teaching, at least implicitly, kids to see the social world in classical terms. And there's actually a good example of this already that I can point to. There has been research, and many of you may already know this work, there has been research that has shown that um, students in college who major in economics over time become more self-interested and more individualistic as a result of that training. Um, and I think that's just a sort of a microcosm of a much more general phenomenon that is happening starting in kindergarten all the way through. Now, of course, when it comes to the material world in which we all live, um, it makes sense to teach five-year-olds and 15-year-olds a classical ontology, right? Tables, chairs, these things are classical objects. They obey classical laws. You can't drive a car in a quantum way. You have to drive a car in a classical way, okay? So that's all fine. The problem, in my view, is that the social world is not classical, at least in my realist interpretation, but quantum. Um, but kids and college students are not learning to make that distinction, to see physical objects as classical, social objects, so to speak, as quantum. And I, that's the distinction I would like to see um, taught um, in, in an ideal kind of a world where we can produce a new kind a more explicitly quantum human being. But instead, what we get in education, the lesson is that social life, and we even, I hear this all the time, even in graduate seminars, that social life is just like um, the world of physical and material objects, only that it's more complicated, right? So we have more complex systems than the physicists or perhaps the chemists have to deal with, uh, but it's still all the same piece, okay? But as you all know, more complex is not a, the right phrase to describe the relationship between quantum mechanics to classical mechanics. Um, it's not just more complex, quantum that is. It embodies a fundamentally different, um, qualitatively different way of thinking about the world, whether you're a realist about it or not. Okay? It's a completely different way of thinking. And so in teaching our kids to see social systems as simply complex physical systems, we're actually teaching them something that is fundamentally mistaken. Okay. So a few thoughts on the implication of this, um, or implications. I mean, one reason this argument matters, I think, is that it's purely scientific or epistemic. And uh, Karen alluded to this at the very beginning, um, which is that if social life really is quantum, and human beings really are quantum, then if we want accurate, the best social science we can have, then that social science should also be quantum rather than classical. You're just gonna get it wrong, at least to some extent, if you're using the wrong ontology to describe human beings in society. So there's a scientific aspect, okay? 
Um, but I think the more interesting part, at least for me, is the political or social aspect of this argument. And to see this, imagine two societies, uh, one populated by pure classical beings and the other one populated by quantum beings. The classical society is illustrated perfectly by Thomas Hobbes' uh, metaphor from the 17th century of the state of nature. And of course, Hobbes is drawing explicitly on materialist classical physics of his day. Okay. Hobbes conceives of the original human position as a state of nature in which individuals are fully separable, we are pretty social, and not surprisingly, we are fundamentally selfish beings as well. With that starting point, Hobbes goes on to describe a very conflictual social dynamic in the state of nature, kill or be killed, in which, in his famous words, life is nasty, brutish, and short. Hobbes' solution to this problem of order, as he called it, of course, is the state. The state uses coercion to impose order and keep society stable, keep us from killing each other, and keep everything sort of under control. Now, I'm not sure how many social scientists today would describe themselves as Hobbesians, um, but his very individualistic ontological starting point, I think, is still very common and is really the baseline in social science for social theory in general, and certainly in my own field of international relations, where Hobbesian thinking is very prominent in the form of the theory of political realism, not scientific realism, but political realism, which privileges power and self-interest above all, something that we're seeing lots of lately. Well, actually, I guess we always have seen this in international politics, but maybe especially lately. In any event, this is, I think, the default setting in IR, my own field, and in social science in general. And as I see it, the fundamental characteristic of this classical picture of society going back to Hobbes, the basic characteristic is a lack of entanglement, an assumption that there is no entanglement between people, that we are fully separable beings. So that's one uh, imagined society. And now imagine a world of quant a society of quantum human beings where entanglement is actually the starting point rather than something completely absent. In that case, whereas competition and conflict characterize the Newtonian picture of clashing billiard balls on the one hand, as you all know, entanglement creates a much more holistic or cooperative world. Um, doesn't mean conflict is impossible, of course, um, but as we've learned in quantum game theory, if you play quantum person's dilemma versus classical person's dilemma, in the quantum version, cooperation actually can be the dominant strategy, whereas in the classical version, you always defect if you're only playing one time. Okay, so co the quantum world, because of entanglement, has the, an inherently more cooperative aspect to it or quality to it than the classical world does. Now, of course, on the other hand, in a quantum world, human beings are going to be less predictable, um, less calculable, maybe less easily mobilized for purposes of the state. Um, I don't know. Um, there would certainly be more fluidity, more flux, more creativity coming up from below, in a sense, in a quantum social society than in a classical one. Now, when I look at these two pictures of society, and then I just think intuitively about, well, what do I think people are like? Um, it seems to me that most of the time people are actually very social and cooperative. And I, would, I suspect that if social science were being invented today, instead of in the 17th century, and if social scientists today looked to physics, like they, we did 300 years ago, for new models or new ways of thinking or an ontology for social science, I suspect that the obvious choice that social scientists would make would be to look to quantum physics rather than classical physics, because quantum physics mirrors social life much more naturally, it seems to me, than the classical picture of clashing billiard balls. In other words, although we see this all the time, scientists and philosophers saying quantum mechanics is so counterintuitive, so counterintuitive, I think that only applies to material objects, classical material objects. That is where quantum thinking is counterintuitive. When it comes to social life, it seems to me the classical worldview is actually wildly counterintuitive, whereas the quantum picture fits quite naturally. And then we're seeing this now empirically also with the quantum cognition literature. So in conclusion, this suggests that resistance to a realist view of quantum social science, 
stems partly from an ideology, an attachment to an ideology of classical social theory that we are all kind of socialized into from day one. It's an artificial ideology, and in my view, it's an alien imposition on what is underneath a quantum subjectivity and a quantum social world. So by embracing a realist view of quantum social theory, which has this kind of coercive quality of saying, you must believe this if it's true, um, one is in a sense, I think, also engaging in political resistance to today's social order. Um, and then that's something that a metaphorical approach to quantum social science cannot do. Um, so I think I will leave it at that, and I very much look forward to your reactions either now or after we sign off. I would love to get any emails or comments from you, um, and I'll try to respond as quickly as I can. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, we will um, move on to Anne Elkwari now to actually look at how we take quantum social science and put it into practice based on her research in Kerala. And, um, yeah, and, and see how, how it plays out in the politics of everyday life. So thank you, Anne, for staying up past midnight in Australia. Uh, it's my pleasure. And I'd just like to say, uh, is the sound OK? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, I'd just like to thank um, Adaptation Connects, the University of Oslo, Karen O'Brien, Future Earth. Um, and it's certainly wonderful um, being able to speak right after Alex Went, whose work has been um, very influential to a lot of IR uh, students and also wider afield in terms of research. Like Alex, I'll also be not be using PowerPoints, I'll also be reading, but also looking up and, and engaging with everyone, um, hopefully. Um, I'm really interested to hear about um, Alex's comments about how classical social science is complicit with the state's project of producing classical subjects. And it kind of is a nice segue into what if it were otherwise? Is it possible for the state to mobilise or govern quantum subjects? And the closest I've come to, and I don't know whether its own citizens or, um, you know, its own academics would make this claim, but the closest I've come to is probably the state of Kerala. Um, it was the first state in the world to democratically elect a communist government in 1957, so it's quite a progressive state. It's got a very um, rich um, and vigorous associational culture. Um, it's uh, got extremely high development indicators. So that's what attracted my interest. Um, and I guess as part of my wider research um, agenda into what I call a propositional praxis rather than an oppositional, which is more Newtonian, the clashing, you know, billiard balls that Alex just spoke about. Um, so my interest is in democratizing and decolonizing, decolonization, sorry, I beg your pardon, decolonizing um, knowledge and practice. And I think there comes a point where empirical reality does collide with classical concepts. And I think that the case of Kerala and its development experience does um, illustrate this. So just a little bit of background about Kerala. Um, Kerala is a southern Indian state of about 35 million people. And it's confounded the classical development formula not in a way like the uh, NICs or the newly industrialised countries as they were then known or the Asian tiger mir miracle economies. Um, they were of course dependent on US geopolitical aid and so forth. But in ways that, um, it developed in ways that were fundamentally at odds with the development orthodoxy. So Kerala's remarkable self-transformation, its remarkable social transformation um, in achieving remarkably high human development indicators on a par with the US at a fraction of US incomes occurred after a pivotal moment in its history. And that kind of recalls Karen's earlier um, slide with the leverage points. So it occurred against a backdrop of having one of the most polarised and caste-ridden societies on the planet just a few decades ago. So there was a rapid mobilisation and transformation of its society. And so it attracted my attention and the attention of many scholars who asked, how did this transformation occur so quickly? Um, how is quantum social science in concordance with it? And what lessons does it offer 
our efforts to transform with respect to things like systems change and the climate crisis. So I'll try and explore some of these questions in this very short talk, only 10 to 15 minutes. This is a very rough cut, it's a first cut, um, unlike uh, Alex's, which is a second cut at least, which was wonderful um, in any case. So, Carol's success has got me thinking about the conditions that catalyse um, positive transformations. And a few things, I came up with a few things that I'd be interested to discuss and, and hear people's um, responses to. One of them, I think, is the importance of intentionality. Um, there's a metaphysical maxim that where intention flows, energy goes. Um, I think that you have to have a visualisation or a scenario of where you want something to go. It doesn't, need not be teleological, but some sort of intention or political uh, policy as to where you would like things to go that is deeply rooted in that culture. I think um, in Alex's book, he mentions subjectivity uh, in terms of will, experience and cognition. I think that past revolutionary movements or movements that sought to enact transformation on a, a societal level supplied, certainly supplied the will in terms of a political vanguard, but they're probably poor on drawing on experience and mobilising real uh, experience of real people. And they might have only used discontent as a proxy rather than harnessing it and flipping it, as I argue is the case in, in Kerala. I also think there's a critical role of ordinary people and everyday embodied experience that subjectivity confers that I think the Kerala case study and its successes in transformation um, shows, uh, you know, it was able to mobilise. Um, so in the case of Kerala, the state and the epistemic community or intellectuals offered only strategic guidance. It really was a mass mobilisation that was predicated on mass education, recalling um, Alex's uh, talking points earlier about pedagogy and the importance of education, um, and the mobilisation of volunteers. So this was taking a campaign um, to uh, enact participatory budgeting and decentralisation right out down to the village level and it involved um, a huge campaign of volunteers to uh, enact cap capacity building, uh, to educate people about things like keeping accounts, so really practical things. Um, and it really drew upon and assumed the adaptive capacity of the population rather than imposing it or talking down to them. So I would argue that Kerala's bold decentralisation experiment um, is quantum in a number of ways and it succeeded because it placed Kerala's citizens as capacious and correlated actors as experiencing subjects at the heart of development. And that's in contradistinction to a more classical notion of development. Um, so, it's interesting too that in classical development and planning, you know, we often hear people's will and participatory as mere buzzwords, and these seem to imitate what happens at the grassroots. So there's been a, a neoliberal hijacking, if you will, of some of these concepts. So the, this decentralisation experiment was one of the largest in the world, and it involved the empowerment of the experiential subject with participatory budgeting and planning. So there was a mass mobilisation of volunteers, retired people, young people, um, and it drew on and mobilised this experiential knowledge. It also respected um, people's felt experience and gave them the dignity um, of agency, drawing on their own know-how, their values, their own arts, their stories. It strategically and creatively mobilised the arts uh, to pitch new narratives. So this is all um, in distinction to a more classical, top-down, technocratic solutions, rule of experts, fixed law, single path, um, you know, kind of conception of development. I'd also argue that Kerala is a good example of welding, and I'm well aware that welding has been used in a number of senses, but I use it, I uh, adopted or employed in the terms of an active verb that confers people with agency to create their own futures. 
I think too that Kerala shows that uh, rapid mass mobilisation is possible. It can put us on a systems change footing in the same way that we might, we used to describe being uh, perhaps on a, a war footing. And that even in a very polarised society, which Kerala was at the time, having been the most caste-ridden uh, and most polarised, um, that the seeds for transformation are there, that the seeds for transformation are there even in our own societies, uh, coming up against this huge resistance of governmentality um, of classical subjects, uh, subjectivity, as uh, Alex mentioned earlier. So Kerala's experience as uh, a, a co-production, worlding of reality by capacious, creative, conscious subjects highlights the importance of consciousness in an alive environment pregnant with intentionality, and that's reflected in a rich associational and civic culture. It also shows that there are other pathways and other ways of being um, and that there are no um, ironclad laws. So there are political campaigns, I argue, right now that do accord with a more quantum reality and ones that I've just mentioned, uh, elements I've just mentioned, participatory, not a vanguard, um, that highlight and draw upon the importance of daily experience um, and that also highlight the importance of relationality and liveliness of social life rather than, you know, stepping out of this, um, you know, classical subjectivity mould, which the state does, you know, um, try, uh, you know, is in cahoots to, to try and mould us into more classical subjects in cahoots with education. But I think the human agency and capacities do belie classical conventional descriptions as Wendt has, uh, Alex has just uh, described far better than I have, and that it is possible to kind of break out of this repressive uh, mould. So I guess my interest is in the prospects for a deliberate and deliberative progressive transformation. There are other places around the world where this has happened in the cooperative movement, alternative economies uh, movement. There are participatory budgeting and decentralisation experiments all around the world where there are subjectivities that are not neoliberal. Um, and I think that these are slowly percolating up um, and that there's not just one singular order, even though there are pretty crushing pressures for us to conform, um, you know, the career tracks and peer pressure and so forth. So I'm not discounting the importance of that. There is quite a lot of pressure. Um, but I think that as quantum beings, we do require political policy, social policy that doesn't sell people short, that does um, sort of cultivate capacity building, but that do this does require a, a movement of people and that this is already happening, we're seeing in terms of Occupy, um, the Indignados movement, um, you know, the Arab Spring, and these need not be I mean, these can often be just short-lived and temporary, but they do build um, a know-how, um, they do build capacity, um, they do build a metis. Um, and I think that classical framings of agency and political action do limit what's possible. They do limit the horizon of the solution space. I'm guessing most of the audience also agree with this. And I like the fact that um, uh, Alex does kind of transfer the, the burden of proof onto the onto his classical colleagues, well, in a coercive way. Okay, well, show us how, um, you know, classic, we're classical beings and so forth. So I think that we're at a critical point at the moment and that um, climate change scholars, as, um, as has been highlighted earlier, um, have identified high impact leverage points for intentional transformation. It's interesting too, there's a parallel here with um, physics in, in terms of Hugh Everett uh, had a similar concept called choice points, which are critical points in time space when the course of an event can be dramatically transformed. It did happen in Kerala and I think it can happen, it must happen at our current point too. Karen pointed to the fact that, you know, the time window is very limited, only three to five years um, by, you know, some people's estimates. So I think that it does behoove us to become more quantum literate and it is um, encouraging to see more and more people um, do that. 
um, and also to harness quantum social science as an emergent paradigm of and for social transformation. I think that is one of the key challenges uh, we face, as well as to ensure that some of these processes aren't just abstract, but they're embodied and that they're peopled. Um, and also, um, just to conclude, um, my interest also is in this notion um, of an informal order. So the role of a more informal order in a more layered and imbricated uh, reality. I'm also interested in how we can rethink power. And I think that it's interesting that um, Alex mentioned the resistances to um, uh, quantum social science, the notion of resistance itself is quite classical, you know, coming up um, against a force. And I think one of the key strategies that we can um, come up with in resisting the resistance, perhaps, is to embrace a more propositional and, and performative agency, to come up with, um, you know, more ideas rather than meeting them um, with more resistance. I don't think that that's going to necessarily bring people around. And I also found quite interesting um, the discussion of how performativity is quantum in Alex's book and I think that offers another pathway. So um, I'll leave it there. This is just very sketchy, um, but I think that in the pluriverse of possibilities and particularly in the in Kerala's case, I think intentionality is the key. Um, we've certainly got the intention. Uh, the wave function is pregnant with possibilities. You know, as Walt Whitman said, we contain multitudes and um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Anne. That was wonderful, and that really tied together well with Alex's presentation um, and showed us a lot of like how we can actually make these these transformations, the quantum transformations, in practice. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to three um, people to. Um, actually um, reflect on both presentations and give some insights um, from the perspective of PhD students, postdocs, and um, researchers who are um, active in this. So the first one is Leonardo Orlando, who is a PhD student in, interna in international relations at Science Po in, um, in Paris, France. And he's just gonna um, share a few of his thoughts and pose a few questions to Alex and Anne. So thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you to Karen O'Brien for hosting this great workshop. Thank you to Alexander Wendt and Anne Corey for these uh, great presentations. Um, I will try to just uh, jump into my questions, be very um, quick. So um, first of all, I, I want to start regarding um, Professor Wendt's presentation and uh, this difference between literal and, and metaphorical that, well, it was of course one of the main resistance that this quantum paradigm is experiencing. And it, it made me think about like this December 1599, when uh, Giordano Bruno is uh, condemned to be burnt at the stake, but the same cardinal, Roberto Melarmino, then in 1616, exonerates Galileo Galilei. This idea that Giordano Bruno, did about, it was pretty literal, his conception of heliocentrism, while Galileo, he managed to present that as a mathematical model. So in some way, we're experiencing the same Kind of the same thing today in in academia, and um, you mentioned, Professor Wen, these um, non-political resistances and uh, political resistances. And in my view, um, th there is a relationship between those two. Um, and I think that the relationship is the awareness um, in each case uh, of all the things that you were mentioning regarding uh, cognitive dissonance, on of course the psychological resistance but also regarding the political project that you mentioned, that it's, uh, it makes perfectly sense, but also, as you said, there is, there is, it's not a conspiracy. So um, if it's not a conspiracy, the thing is, it's, it's a lack of awareness um, of uh, social scientists in general, or uh, teachers that are uh, teaching to, to people like from kindergarten to grad school, uh, how the world works. Um, and this is related to, well, you, you mentioned Foucault, and um, of course, the, the production of the subject. Um, but also Foucault, he, he talks the cultivation of the self 
in French, le technique du, du soi. Um, and this cultivation of the self, um, that it's, it's interesting because in, in Foucault conception is very, it tends toward the individual. And there has been critics to that, for example, Pierre Hadot, uh, an historian of ancient philosophy, that he was criticizing that because he was in the Stoic tradition that Foucault presents. Actually, it was not to cultivate the self and try to change ourselves just for pleasure or in order to get deeper inside us, but it was to get outside, to get out from us. Um, so then is the other, the other thing like, well, where is the awareness, the, 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 the role that it's played by consciousness in, in all this? And uh, Alexander Warren, in his book, he, he says that, well, it, it's a note, right? But it's like that people don't understand what they are doing. People cannot understand what they are doing. So, um, and this difference between active moments and passive moments, and sometimes people can be behaving in a way that they don't understand why. And as it has been mentioned, experimental psychology, evolutive psychology, neuroscience, or even Buddhism, they are doing a lot of work on that, that most of the things that we do, um, it's not, uh, we are not aware of that. So um, the question here will be, what's the way to go to uh, society true? So what, what's the approach in order to get to the quantum society? Um, it could be maybe a methodological approach, like a project in order to try to understand quantum as some system and some work that can be done on consciousness, on awareness, on the role that each one of us plays, why we are active monads um, in order to, to get there. And uh, also another thing that for me was um, very important in, in the presentation is this idea that, well, most of the problems that we are facing, uh, because you say that, well, actually our war is it's, uh, uh, it's in a pretty bad shape. Uh, and David Bohm, he, he was saying the same thing and that actually all the problems that we're having was, was a problem of thinking, of bad thinking. He literally says that. And Bohm, he says this, um, this idea of the society as a wall, right? Of the world as a wall. Actually, this, um, the undivided wallness in flowing movement. Um, so my question will be um, how, how to get from the individual level to that wallness and how to get, what, what's like the path that uh, maybe you're exploring? Uh, I think that this is also a question for, uh, for Anne. Uh, of course, it reflects on that. Uh, it was, I, I was very intrigued when, uh, first of all, you mentioned this almost psychoanalytical approach, right? This, this work on, on the self. So maybe that's also for Anne. It's just one last uh, question for, for Anne. It's like, um, in relation to that, um, the mentions that you, the movements that you mentioned at, at the end of your presentation, um, they're, they're not really out from the classical paradigm, or at least it was like lots of contestation, but it was not any, I mean, it was of course propositions, but in my view from, from outside of different movements that you mentioned in the US, in Spain, in, in France. So it's like how it's possible to nourish intentionality with the direction that is not just contestation or the, the the willingness to go to a place that doesn't exist anymore. So these are my true, my true questions. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll take the question, the answers to the questions after all three of the um, reflectors have reflected. So the next is um, Chad Monfreda, who is a postdoc at Princeton University and um, with a very interdisciplinary background and interest in quantum social science. Uh, thanks, Leo, and uh, thanks, Alex and Anne, for those provocative thoughts. Uh, so, I mean, if I just want to start with one big question that I might put out there and then offer some of my own thoughts that you might turn over in your head and respond to later, you could do that. Uh, so, the, I mean, the big question that I have is how we, um, how we see and understand the, uh, the, the tensions and the synergies that come about when we take an ontological, uh, a, a realist and an ontologically pluralist position at the same time. And of course, from a classical perspective, um, it seems like that would be an impossibility that at root, um, there's only one reality and any kind of social reality must necessarily follow from that reality with any, without any room for, for mental causation and so forth. So it seems to me under uh, a quantum realism, 
um, we could ask what under what conditions does that uh, unified reality, and we might say more about what we mean, um, collapses into different social worlds um, that are nevertheless unified under some broader thing, and what is that thing? Um, so, you know, there have been alternative attempts to reconcile that problem. Um, emergentism, for example, and I think Alex, you point out some of the limits, um, the limits that you see there. Um, you know, I could imagine other ways of approaching the problem. Uh, like, I don't think it's uh, outrageous to consider that consciousness itself might be an ontological and primitive, and that we might work uh, backwards from there to, to derive an account of material and social and mental, uh, mental worlds. Um, but that that line of thought is even further from the mainstream and mostly confined to, to philosophy. So what I think uh, your contribution, Alex, is especially interesting for is that you're trying to uh, recognize and reconcile these paradoxes and gaps that have existed in the classical world view for centuries, in the case of the mind-body problem, right, and quantum mechanics for the last century or so but offering alternative ways to understand that and get around it from within. I think that kind of approach is uh, useful, maybe even necessary, if sort of classical minds are gonna uh, extricate themselves from their own problematic subjectivities they build for themselves, uh, to work that out from the inside out. Um, so when it comes to the resistance to quantum, um, it's understandable why physicists and scientists more generally might be hesitant to engage because they've been very successful in leaving these problems aside for a long time. Um, in the case of social science, though, I think it's less acceptable. So many so social theorists are trying to address and ameliorate the problems that come about um, from the bifurcation of nature that we take for granted. Um, at the same time, I think there's, I see some hesitancy among social scientists to engage questions of subjectivity and consciousness. And I think that's actually the wrong move. Um, but I think fortunately there's a lot of material that you're proposing that we could take forward um, and all sorts of rich opportunities for engaging the social sciences. So I think it would go a long ways to make those opportunities uh, clear for to help people see themselves uh, within this landscape and how they might adapt their thinking or challenge their some, some of their own ideas in accord with it. Um, so thinking through some of those ideas, I can just put some of these out here if you want to respond. I think one that, you know, and your work is exemplary for, for taking these ideas seriously um, and taking them to the field. So it makes me think that, well, if, if humans are truly quantum, um, then we'd expect social sciences to have more of a problem in describing the behavior of subjects who aren't classically trained. <laughs> Right. So that's where I think anthropology gets actually extra leverage and we'd expect deviation for the social sciences to explain behavior in those subjects who aren't so trained. Um, that extends, I think, to the private sphere and family life as well. Um, also new opportunities for critique that are both realist and constructivist at the same time. So there are instruments of policy and power that are operative in the world today would take for granted that are constructed around the classical idea, uh, calculation of utility rates, like the aggregation of social welfare, um, uh, the interpretation of discount rates. I think these are all game for challenge and reformulation. Um, so I'd like to see somebody try to do just that in quantum terms and see what it looks like. Uh, a third area would be a quantum sociology of scientific knowledge or sociology of social scientific knowledge. and I was interested that you were getting to that, Alex, in your comments on education. Um, and I think it's not just education, but it's in the entire culture, pop culture and media. And for example, I, I think of um, the role that public spokespeople for science like Brian Greene or Neil deGrasse Tyson have, and on one hand, more or less saying there's no room for consciousness, consciousness and uh, um, saying there's only room for a physicalist or materialist point of view, but at the same time saying things like it's very likely that we're living in a simulation. <laughs> like if there's no cognitive distance between that, they could they can just get away with making statements like that. Um, and then just to close, the last thing is I also was glad to hear you mention Hobbes, because I've been thinking about this in terms of the imagination and the performative political imagination. 
and particularly through the work of Yara Nizrahi. Um, and I think he has a book called Necessary Fictions, which goes through the, he argues that the materialist worldview is essential to our modern political order, uh, which we're getting to in the end there. And he's building it out from Hobbes forward. Um, so rethinking, I mean, using the imagination to rethink um, our thoughts itself, I think, is another way forward on that, uh, in terms of the yeah, political performance. So I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Chad. And um, we're having a little workshop here. That's why we're all in the same room. Um, and our final reflector is um, Ananka Laubser, who is a senior lecturer at Northwest University in South Africa, and also a philosopher who works on paradigm shifts. So she'll give her insights and some questions, and then we'll give you the opportunity to respond to all of the good questions. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Um, thank you, Alex and Anne. Uh, my biggest problem is to do this in five minutes, so I'll try my best. Um, I would like to, to give some perspective uh, of my own work where I think that quantum social theory can be useful, as well as I would like to make some um, comments about the, uh, re how can I say, the um, resistance to it, because I have come across a very good epistemic formulation of it, which if there is time I would like to uh, quote. So for this, uh, we, we would need some background, epistemic background, um, and I would like us to uh, imagine a person trying to engage with reality, and this engagement occurs through a set of filters. These filters, uh, if we would let, just uh, choose a definition now, could be named belief systems. But um, let's say that the first filter is the furthest on the continuum of the pre-theoretical. In other words, these are very deeply assumed, very fundamental beliefs, um, maybe religious ground motives, things that are uh, self-evident and not really related to reality in terms of testability. So they are truly committed beliefs. Uh, a little bit further on the line uh, towards more theoretical beliefs, we can get a system like the worldview system. Uh, this is a broader picture of reality. And uh, you can already see that this has to connect more with reality, so it's not so self-evident and you have some feedback, reality kicks back into the worldview and it, it, it has some effect on the worldview. But strange enough, right in the middle on this line, between the pre-theoretical and the theoretical, we sit with a system that we uh, historically in the history of uh, philosophy of science have called paradigms. The paradigm is interesting because it stands almost with its legs across this line. So it is half theoretical and half pre-theoretical. <laughs> you have parts of your paradigm that is expressed in a lingual way that are probability statements or that they are expressed logically or rationally. So they become accessible in a way that the truly pre-theoretical things sometimes are not. So paradigm is a sort of hybrid system. But moving more towards the actual theoretical side, then the next system that we discuss usually in philosophy of science is the pure theories. A theory itself is also seen as a belief system uh, because it's also a set of statements, etc. And the last one, if you go even further, is that you reach the encyclopedic um, conditions for the specific sciences. In other words, you get botany, zoology, physics, etc. And Although sciences have their own rules for what makes botany botany, and that is actually a belief system. So if you study plants, you don't do zoology, you do botany. And, and these are things that usually scientists, strange enough, in those fields can't really tell you because it becomes the philosophy of that field. You, you meta uh, theorize about the field when you try to, to answer those questions. Right, so with this background, where I see quantum social theory, actually, uh, both its strength and as well as the controversy on it, is when we specifically look at the movement between paradigm theory and special science. In other words, how this, this is a double way traffic. And um, to do this, we need to look uh, mainly at the system of theories. Uh, I think epistemically, the furniture inside that system uh, can be classified as things and relations, uh, things are simply things like entities, events, phenomena. The relations are uh, ways in which they are connected to each other. And if we see the history of science, we can see that the first through the Middle Ages and the antiquity that scientists usually studied things. 
the things had primacy, so the entities had a sort of primacy, and the relations weren't that important. But this changed through the Middle Ages, uh, I mean, sorry, through the Renaissance and even in modern science, up to the point where we have almost reached a sort of functionality where uh, we can't explain reality as entities anymore. We simply uh, explain it as in terms of relations. And what is interesting is in this theoretical realm, several of these sets of relations exist. So they are, in, in the first sense, they are coherent. In other words, they connect to each other. Secondly, they sort of build on top of each other. So certain ones presuppose certain other ones. They have analogical uh, relationships, anticipations, retrocipations, etc. They have a, a, a web of interrelation. But at the same time, they are also unique. So they can't be reduced to one, one another. And I, I can see Alex will already <laughs> recognize that some of the claims against quantum social theory is that the, the, the social is being reduced to the physical. So this is uh, what I would like to have in mind. And so if we look specifically at the first two of these relations, they are the numerical, the spatial, the kinematic, and the physical. They're interesting in the following way. The numerical gives us unity and diversity as its core, that relationship. And that tells us that these, the rest of the relationships aren't irreducible, they are irreducible to each other. They are all unique. The spatial gives us continuity in that we find the relation between them. They are connected in a continuum. The kinematic strange enough, is about constancy. So movement, it, it took physics about um, 1,400 years before they realized Movement is not change, movement is constant. But the one that we are interested in is the physical relationship, the physical um, modality or aspect. And that gives us change. And that is where I think quantum social theory is strong because this gives us a new mode of explaining change. So what we do there is we take the physical uh, relation and we abstract it. In other words, we focus very hard on it epistemically while we squash all the other relations down for a moment. And I've only given us the lower lower relations. You, you can go higher, you get the, the biological, the psychological, you get even more uh, lingual, rational, visual, ethical, aesthetic, etc. that goes up. You say so you squash uh, the rest, and the responsible scientist plays his game of abstraction and reintegration, where you look at the science through the the view of, of physical, the physical aspect, but you reintegrate it responsibly. And my time is up. Um, so I would just like to quickly quote what I think was the best epistemic formulation of this problem. And maybe Alex, I, I can perhaps send you some of these uh, resources if you want to If for quantum social theory to work, in other words, to be true, and um, I remember the word analogical versus true, if it, if it if you need following two things. The first one is the reality of consciousness of two entities is to any single relational context. Sorry, we're having trouble hearing you. Can you try to speak into the okay, well, is is it okay like this? That's better. Thank you. Okay, so I will just repeat quickly the two things that are conditions for such quantum theory to be epistemically responsible is one that the reality of in fact, that's not really helping. Do you think you could move to just to, to the other to the other side or turn somehow? Oh, try from try from there. Um, okay, how's it now? Good there. It's just it seems very sensitive if you turn your face that we kind of lose the. Um, okay, I will try to read like this. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Give that a go. Okay, I'll give it a go. So the reality of the concretely in existing entities exceeds any single relational context in which such entities function. So therefore, neither can one reify the relational coherences into zero entities, nor can one functionalize the entities, in other words, surrendering their existence to some or other functional aspect. And the second one is that the multiple functional relations within which these entities exist imply that these aspectual functions are primitive and irreducible, and you must keep them that way, explaining one of them as a mode of explanation therefore presuppose an implicit acknowledgement of the rest. So uh, basically you cannot say that the social, the social relation is simply a physical reduction. Um, and that's it, I'm sorry, five minutes is <laughs> incredibly short, thank you. Okay, thank you Ananka for that. That was a, a deep philosophical approach on the um, quantum social theory. And I think that that's, um, 
important and, and relevant when we're talking about shifting a paradigm very quickly. Um, yeah, so now, um, Alex and Anne, we have um, about 15 minutes for you to respond to these, and maybe, Alex, you can start. Oops, can you, can you unmute your, um, your microphone? All right, it says, I'm now unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, well, that's, it's very difficult to respond. I'm, I, only, I was only hearing Annika in and out, so I, I'm not sure I was able to follow her entire argument. And her argument seems somewhat different um, than, than Chad and Leonardo's arguments, although I think they, they go together. Um, I want to say as little as possible, because I would actually like to hear more people in, in the audience and get their reactions too. I guess um, the one thing that strikes me um, in, in Leonardo and Chad's comments in particular, and it ties very nicely into Anne's uh, presentation, is the role of the individual and, and how much this whole perspective really is a bottom-up kind of thing. And that the key to social transformation is individual transformation. And I liked, uh, I believe it was, was it Chad or Leo who was talking about the psychoanalytic aspect here. And it's not just about caring for the self, but then in caring for the self, somehow one is also caring for society. So I just was struck by this, and I, that's not a direct response, but I think that's sort of something that ties together all of these comments, um, a bottom-up versus a top-down kind of approach. And, and I think Anne's comments about um, Kerala, is it, did I just pronounce that correctly or not? I'm not sure. Kerala. Kerala, right, Kerala, there we go. Um, you know, illustrate this, the, the role of decentralization and participatory democracy and so on. And, I'm just, I actually had a question for Anne, which is why has the Kerala experiment not been copied more within India? You know, you would think this is a big success story, at least by certain measures, and of course maybe that's part of the issue, is what measures are we using to, to, to define development, but I'm, I'm curious about why it hasn't been spread more quickly, um, if it is, especially if it's a quantum kind of perspective. Um, but I very much take Leonardo's point that the issue really here is lack of awareness. Um, I think when students come into contact with these ideas, they're immediately attracted to them. Um, it's, it's really people in my generation who are especially resistant to them. So um, I think the awareness issue is the crucial one, and that starts at the level of the individual. Um, and you know, the old, the old phrase, think globally, act locally, right? Well, that's in a sense what this is, I think, pointing to as well. And um, I mean, there are many other things in all three of the comments that I, I really need to think about before I would even want to say anything. Um, so, um, but I, I was very, I found them very sympathetic. So, um, um, so I guess, I guess I want to just leave it at there at that rather than try to sort of get into some of the specific points, um, which I would really need to hear more about in order to respond properly, I think, so. Okay, Anne, how about you? Do you have any responses? I'd echo what Alex just said. Um, really great points from Leo, Chad and Ananka. And I'd have to really, I'll take them on board, but I'd have to really think about them. Um, and I appreciate Alex's kind of synthesis of those comments and what he took out was pretty much what I took out as well. Um, you know, uh, looking at the level of the individual, the bottom up percolation rather than the top down um, imposition. The question of why the uh, Keller's experiment was not replicated elsewhere in India is a very interesting one um, that I do try and tackle um, in the chapter in my book. Um, but I found the comments really, really useful. Um, but also, like Alex, I'd be interested to hear from other people in the 10 minutes or so remaining. Okay. Christina, do we have any questions that have come in from participants? Yes, we've had one. Um, you should be able to read it straight in, in your chat box, but uh, I, I can read that for you. It's from Rob Ronsi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And he's asked, what sort of relationship does quantum social theory have with other theories, such as complexity or chaos theories, that are also trying to challenge, in quotes, classical paradigms based on modern scientific breakthroughs? Are they compatible, competing, or perhaps covering similar ground, but suffering from a lack of awareness of each other? I have a thought about that. Um, is, how, how are we doing this? Are we, um, yeah, you can go ahead. 
Okay. Um, just quickly, I mean, my understanding is that, um, and certainly in my own field where about, of international relations, where some complexity arguments have been developed uh, by a number of scholars and chaos theory to a more limited extent, it's very clear, but those arguments are still ultimately classical. Um, but there is something I'm told called quantum chaos and quantum complexity. So maybe there's a quantum quantized version of chaos and complexity theory. I think the spirit, in a sense, the, the spirit that motivates some of the scholars that I know who do complexity theory in IR is very similar to the spirit that animates me, which is a more holistic kind of systemic kind of um, way of thinking. Um, but I do think there's a tension there, and there's no entanglement in class in complexity theory. There's no entanglement in chaos theory. So if, if you don't have entanglement, then that really separates you into the classical world, and I think would, would limit the kind of argument one can make. Um, but this is certainly an intersection that needs to be explored more in a conversation that should be had, I think. So there's undoubtedly much more to say about that relationship than I obviously could do just now. So. And I've just got a question to add as well, as well as a comment of sorts. I think they're all three, as far as I know, in my limited understanding, are considered post-classical. Um, I wonder why there's been such an uptake in um, IR of complexity theory and in the wider social sciences. Any thoughts about that, Alex? Um. No, I don't know. Well, I, it lends itself to modeling. Agent-based modeling is sort of the technique that people use to talk about complexity in my own field. And um, you can do really cool stuff with it. And if you've got good methods training, um, you can build nice models that grow societies and, and, and sort of simulate how things can evolve. It's a very different way of thinking than the standard um, variable-based, let's test our hypotheses kind of social science that I was trained in initially. Um, so I think it is. It does have the feeling of being something quite new, um, yeah. and but it's also old in a way. So um. I think it also has to do with um, that it talks about emergent properties and this idea that you know things are showing up. And you write that about about that in your book, um, Alex, about uh, yeah, subvention and um, and things. Um, I would like to just ask um, two questions um, that are going back to um, I think what um, Chad was talking about with the, the 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 burden being on social scientists to be involved um, and starting to look take these um, theories more seriously. And what Ananka was pointing out with that you know like it's been critiqued a lot for reducing the social to the physical, so that um, in some ways you're getting criticized from both sides, from the physical scientists and the social scientists, because it's 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 not making either um, happy, which is uh, challenging. So yeah, if you could see like, yeah, re reflect on that. Well, um, uh, on the issue of reducing the social to the physical, um, it seems to me if you buy the premise of the book of the causal closure of physics, then everything is physical, right? Um, and the, it's, so it's not really a question of reducing the social to the physical. It's a question of showing how it is that the social is a kind of physicality. And it must be a kind of physicality because if, it's, if the social is not physical, then where is it? You know, it's, it's invisible. We can't see it. You can't touch it. Um, so I want to suggest that, um, and, and in a sense, it's really, I actually see this as um, it's using the physical science of, of quantum mechanics to kind of illuminate the social world, um, but it also works the other way. I mean, I would guess down the road, and I don't explore this in the book because I'm not a quantum physicist, but in the long run, I would suggest that if quantum social science is true about its assumptions about human beings and so on, then physicists may do well down the road to read social scientists. And the way we think about the interactions of units or particles, namely people, um, and that may help physicists interpret quantum theory in the proper way. Um, now, that's, of course, a long run ambition. But I think, you know, social science has always been at the short end of the science stick for all this for centuries. And I think this may reverse that to some extent. So I don't see this as a reductive kind of thing at all. It's really about rescuing consciousness and finding a place for consciousness and subjectivity in our ontology. And that's not just about quantum, then. That's also the whole panpsychist thing. Um, that briefly came up in some of the in some of the comments earlier. So, um, so I would resist that that sort of line 
pretty strongly, I think. But it's obviously a long conversation, though. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I like that the physical is social and um, that we need to change our thinking. Um, I find that a lot of um, like PhD students and postdocs are very interested in these types of approaches. And so what would your advice be to them if they were going to kind of go outside of um, the mainstream classical approaches and um, and embrace quantum social science. Um, and you're a good example of having done a really um, interesting PhD dissertation using this. And um, and Alex, you have a lot of experience with um, students who are um, are trained in classical but interested in quantum. And you want to talk more to Anne or both? Um, you can start, Alex, and then I'll, we'll go to Anne. Um, so advice to people, well, to PhD students, it's tricky, of course, because they have to worry about job market and, and the reception of their work by search committees that know nothing about quantum social theory and may think this is all nuts. So there are pragmatic considerations, obviously, there. Um, I do think one piece of advice that applies certainly to students who are not yet in grad school, um, which is to learn the math actually go learn the math. I never learned the math, and it's apparently not that hard. Um, that's what my brother tells me anyway, but it's very unfamiliar, and it's not taught as a routine matter, of course, to social scientists in college at all. So if you have the math, then you can, then you can play the I'm more technically sophisticated you game than you game with any classical social scientist. Um, and of course, you can do fun things with the math in relation to experiments and all that kind of stuff. So that's part of it. The other piece of advice, though, I would say is that is um, to find a problem that um, is narrow enough where you can actually show that there's a difference between these two different interpretations of the problem and then make the case for the quantum interpretation being a better one. So that would mean identifying, you know, what exactly is a classical view of development, let's say, versus a quantum view. Um, and then try to sort of show that these differences are manifested empirically and so on. So a problem-driven approach, um, don't take gigantic risks if you're a PhD student, obviously. It's one thing for me to write a book like this. I've got tenure, blah, 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 you know, no, I can't, my reputation is already what it, whatever it is. Um, but I think incrementally um, problem-driven work that especially is backed up with some knowledge of the physics, um, in an ideal world, that's what will happen, and, and hopefully, eventually, there'll be programs where students can actually learn the stuff uh, in a systematic way, but those don't exist yet. Okay, great. Anne, any reflections? I think that's excellent advice to take a problem-driven approach, particularly in a discipline like geography, where I think you, um, the onus is on us to do more field work-based uh, research. Um, in my case, as an early career researcher, um, I just find I think that graduate students do tend to, to be more open to, to speculative and experimental you know, kind of approaches. Um, I was lucky to have good support around me, uh, people who are also quite open to, to this. And I mean, at the end of the day, we do live in a quantum reality. So it, it's, it might seem counterintuitive, as Alex said earlier, but it's, what our physical social reality is. Um, so it behooves us to try and, um, you know, to, to embrace it um, in a sense. Um, at the end of the day, I think it was just a lot of fun as well because it's more cutting edge. I think um, people are more familiar with Karen Barad, but it takes a long gestation. I think you'd agree with that, Karen. You know, um, I mean, Karen Barad's work has been out since 2008. So it's almost been a decade. But I think that Alex's book, will really um, revolutionise, you know, not to embarrass you there, Alex, but I think that it will have a, a deep Im impact, but it will take time as, as you yourself predict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in terms of problem-based work, we have an excellent problem with a lot of the global challenges that we're facing right now. And if there's anything that we, where we need to actually put people at the centre and their subject, make them the subjects of the solutions to these issues rather than the, um, just the objects to be changed, then um, you know we need a theory that actually puts. Um, I think in the end of your book, Alex, you talk about you know um, giving people putting meaning, giving people meaning in the universe again, um, or something like that. And I think that's really important. And Anne, your work really shows 
you know, just how to drive social change by motivating, activating, empowering, and um, you know, unleashing that potential. Um, so, can you know, we're just wrap, just Can I just riff on Anne's, one of Anne's points very quickly? Uh, Anne's, I liked your point, Anne, about it behooves us to embrace this, and I think I would link that to a sense of responsibility, um, mm -hmm. especially as academics. We have the best jobs in the world, right, as professors, by, by far the best jobs in the world. We're paid to basically sit back and think and just write whatever we want to write. So do something responsible with that, right? Take a risk. Say something that we don't already know. Say something that might make a difference. And, um, and I think this is one way to do that. You have to do it carefully. But um, I think it's very important for all social scientists to take responsibility, whether it's quantum or not, but to see ourselves as agents of change, whether we like it or not, basically. Okay, well, we've reached um, the hour and a half, and it's 1.30 a.m. for Anne, so um, we appreciate um, the, the stretch of the time zones, and it's the start of your day for Alex. Um, and I really would like to thank um, Leonardo Orlando, Chad Mumfreda, and um, Ananka Laubster for being um, excellent um, reflectors on the, uh, on the talks and posing really good questions. And um, thank you both, Alex and Anne, for excellent presentations. If anyone has any other comments, um, you know, we take them by email, but I think this is a really, really important topic and really, really exciting. And um, my sense is that it will be taken up a lot faster than we think. So thank you very much. And I look forward to talking next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone. You'll get a follow-up email from the webinar system linking to this recording and giving you a way to get in touch with Karen and her group at Adaptation Connects. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.